number six is going to be our first song this morning. Number six. Certainly good to see each one of you out today. Thank you for coming. Number six, we'll sing all four stanzas.
reading this morning for, from 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Start with verse 1. Then David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel. And with them to the priests and Levites who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shahor in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kerjath Jerem. And David and all Israel went up to Bala and to kerjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadad, and Uzzah and Ohio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God to me? So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had.
Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, if you would find in your Bibles, for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I believe we're starting on verse 6 today. Uh, last week, we got into the chapter uh, and discussing a, a difficult uh, task for every congregation of the Lord's church, and that's church discipline. And we discussed the matter at hand that at the congregation of Corinth, there was a man that had his uh, father's wife. We don't know the specifics necessarily of what that means. We just know that it was something serious. It was serious to the point that Paul said, this is something that wasn't even named among the Gentiles. That's a serious thing. <laughs> That's a big thing. Uh, and Paul said, you guys are puffed up about this. You, you, you're prideful about it. It's almost as if the congregation had it in their minds that they were so accepting, so loving, that you know they loved this man even though he was in his sin. And he said, you shouldn't be puffed up with pride over this. You should be mourning because this man's soul is currently lost. And so they needed to withdraw fellowship from him in the hopes that he would return back to the fold uh, to save him uh, whenever the Lord returns. Uh, and that's what he points out here. He said, uh, verse 5 says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And we talked about the fact that uh, this individual would be brought to shame so that he wouldn't be brought to eternal shame at the day of the Lord Jesus. Uh, this man uh, may feel that shame and return uh, to the Christ. And so in verse 6 he says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Again, you, you, you've got this congregation that's boasting. They're, they're filled with pride over this. Um, but there's something that they were failing to realize here. He says, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is used in various places in the scripture. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It all depends on the context. Matthew 13.33 speaks of leaven in a good sense. Someone read that for me. Matthew 13, verse 33. So here we have a picture of the church, that when the church would get here, that is the kingdom of heaven, that it would be like a woman who puts leaven in a lump of bread. Uh, well, even if we're not cooks or you know, you know, some, you know, anything of that nature, what happens when you put leaven in, uh, in, in dough and you mix it around in it? What eventually happens to that dough? Or rather, I should say... Yeah, it all becomes, it, it begins to spread out. That's what you hope anyway. I have mixed leaven together with uh, the way you're supposed to, you know, warm water, and then check back on it later, and it didn't do anything. It seemed like it almost got smaller. So sometimes, you know, maybe the leaven was old, I don't know, but, um, you know, it, it spreads. It causes the dough to spread and get bigger. Well, that's what leaven does, is it, it, it works in that fashion. So he's saying, what's going to happen? Well, the kingdom is going to be a little bit of leaven and the kingdom is going to spread. It's going to grow. Especially the church here with this problem that they had. Mm -hmm. And as we view this and we view the congregation with so many different factions in it and, and uh, here they are with this going on and this man laughing here and they're justifying it. Mm -hmm. and, and he's telling them what to do about it. How to distance Mm -hmm. I said, when you discipline this man, it will go throughout the congregation. Mm -hmm. Other folks will see this, mm -hmm. and it'll have its, it, it will have a positive effect on their life. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how that this leaven spread through the congregation by disciplining this one man that has this terrible problem. Mm -hmm. and, and if you didn't hear, um, Brother Dwight, what he mentioned to is that uh, he said the way that this Leaven would work is that other members of the congregation would see how the how 
how this instance was handled and what it would do is it would have a positive effect on this individual or not just this individual hopefully but on other individuals the the idea is that they they would take the idea of sin seriously they take the idea of uh, salvation of others seriously and that that would have a positive effect not just i would dare say not just on members of the congregation but it might have somewhat of a positive effect on those who might be outside of the congregation um and, and, and so, you know, the idea is that that little leaven in the act of disciplining this person would have a huge effect throughout the entire congregation. I would also kind of add to that that the inverse would occur if they didn't take care of this issue in the fact that if they allowed this one person and justified this person in his sin, how easy is it to justify another person in their sin and another person in their sin? Uh, and so you can see in a negative fashion how if they did nothing, you'd have a little bit of leaven, uh, leavening the whole lump. Jesus, uh, Jesus talks about the uh, leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees mm -hmm. in Matthew 16. Yes. And he's dealing with that just like what you said. A little bit of contamination will cause a big problem. Mm -hmm. I can remember when we were children, we'd pick, get potatoes up and you get them up and put them up, lay them out on the floor, or in our case, in a stable barn or something like that. But you had to constantly check them and move them and rotate them. If you got one that was rotten, mm -hmm. even though there was one amongst the bunch, if you didn't get him out, it wouldn't be long. Everything that he touched would come rotten. The, uh, there's an old, you just kind of reminded me of an old saying, you, you put, you, you, if you didn't hear, um, here, Keith, what he talked about was the fact that, you know, they, they would uh, get in a harvest of potatoes, and what they'd have to do is regularly check and move and, you know, the potatoes on a regular basis because if one near the bottom went rotten and they didn't take care of it quickly, it would affect all the potatoes that were up above it. Slowly but surely, it would keep working its way up. Um, we have a common saying, one bad apple spoils what? The whole bunch. And so, you know, Keith gave a... Uh, practical application to that saying, but again, you see that here is that one person allowed to live in sin like that is going to have a negative effect on the congregation as well. So that is, you know, definitely we can see how the leaven would work in a positive and negative fashion uh, within this congregation. Um, and so Paul gives a commandment to the congregation here in verse 7. He says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. <clears throat> and so when he says to purge out the old leaven, he is making an allusion to, obviously, the Passover here, because he makes mention of that in this verse. He's referring back to Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, where the children of Israel were given a command concerning the days of unleavened bread. Uh, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your house. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, and only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your gener generations by an ordinance forever. And so the Israelites were to purge out leaven from their homes during this uh, special occasion, during the, the, the days of unleavened bread. Uh, in the same manner, the Corinthian congregation is to purge out this old leaven. Um, the, the idea here is they're to withdraw fellowship from this individual uh, who is living his life in sin. And this is compared to removing leaven from dough, which we'll see in the new statements, uh, next few statements. He said that you may be a new lump. So that's a name that we never would think of a congregation referred to as, but they're called a lump here, a new lump. Um, a new lump which is fresh. It doesn't have any type of contamination in it whatsoever. And this is the way that every congregation and 
Christians should be in order to be used by the Lord. We should do our best to be without any contamination. Um, he says, for even Christ, uh, our Passover, uh, is sacrificed for us. And so this is another instance where Christ is referred to as our uh, Passover, that is, the Passover offering. Um, and again, this goes back to Exodus uh, chapter 12 and other chapters where we read about various things concerning the Passover sacrifice. We read the fact that the Passover sacrifice was to be without any physical blemish, uh, chapter 12, verse 5. Well, Christ is without any spiritual blemish. Both were slain uh, in the evening. Leviticus 23, verse 5 points out when that was to be done. Matthew 27, verses 45 through 50 points that out concerning the Christ. Both sacrifices delivered others from death. When the animal was sacrificed, what was done with the blood of the Passover lamb? It was put on the doorposts. And uh, when the angel of death came, whoever had blood on the doorposts, they lived. Well, Christ, through the sacrifice of his blood, has delivered us from death. You can reference Revelation 1 verse 5, Ephesians 1 verse 7, Matthew 26 verse 28. And uh, their bones were not to be broken. Um, Exodus 20, 12 verse 46 uh, points that out. Um, we have references to John chapter 36, 37, and Psalm 34 verse uh, 20 point those things out to us. And so Christ, you know, is our sacrifice. Uh, our Passover is sacrifice for us. That is... Um, as Christ sacrificed himself to make us clean, what should be our duty as Christians? To, uh, to continuing to uh, keep ourselves from contamination and continuing to be clean. And so, and this is, isn't just at each of us as individuals, but as we see here from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it's the duty of every congregation as well. So he says in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so therefore, in light of everything that's been said, in light of the sacrifice that Christ has given us, in light of our needing to be uh, a new lump, he said, let us keep the feast. Now, this is a reference to the feast that was partaken uh, during the time of the Passover. Uh, Exodus 12, verses 8 through 10, if you want to find that in your Bibles real quick, uh, points out uh, that meal. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire <clears throat> and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not, uh, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. But roast with fire, his head and his legs, with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it in the morning shall ye burn with fire. <clears throat> now, I do want to point out here that, you know, some have taken this as a reference to the Passover, or even the reference to them needing to take the Lord's Supper. And he's not saying, well, you need to keep the Passover. He's not saying, like, well, because of this person, you need to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, what he's referring to is that when the Jews took part in this Passover meal, part of that was putting away of all the leaven. And in this instance, leaven seems to be emblematic of sin. And so he's saying, take part in that feast as far as flush out all the leaven, get rid of the sin, just, you know, withdraw from this person who is living in wickedness. And so we are to engage in the service of God by putting away all evil. That's what he means by keeping this feast, getting rid of that, uh, th those negative things in order to serve God. Not with the old leaven, not under the influence of the old conditions of the life we had before Christ, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, not under the influence of evil or sin like this man in Corinth was, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, which seems to imply that the congregation could not be sincere, they could not be in truth if they did not put away this man. They did not withdraw fellowship from him because of his activities. And so in order for them to lead this life that he's talking about, this is what they would have to do. What questions or thoughts are there before we move forward? You know, the Old Testament and New Testament are just, they speak about each other. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament has so many examples of what we need, what they needed to do in order to be pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. And we can take those examples through the commands that we have in the New Testament and look back at the Old Testament and see exactly how God expects us to live. Mm -hmm. And you use several examples. I mean, there's the sacrifice, the, the, the Passover, the putting the blood over, and, and what it means. Those people were required to put blood in a certain spot. Mm -hmm. They were required to be in a certain spot. Mm -hmm. And if they violated those commands then, it's just like us today. We are required to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. If we stay in Christ, salvation is there. But if they went outside that door, just like us going outside of Christ, we lose our salvation. Yeah. And there's so many things in the Old Testament. The, the ark. They built the ark and they had to be in it. Mm -hmm. If they got out of it, they lost their lives. Mm -hmm. The church is the uh, antitype of the ark. We get in it, we stay in it. Mm -hmm. But we do it through a biblical command that's true. Yes. And we follow that example. Uh, if you didn't hear Keith, what he mentioned the fact is that we saw a few examples from the Old Testament here. And you read a lot of that in the New Testament, that the New Testament and the Old Testament are directly connected together. The idea of the Passover and Christ, the leaven, and purging out sin. And he even made mention to, um, you, you go back to Genesis chapters uh, five, uh, 6 through 8, with the uh, mention of the ark. And you actually stole the example I was going to give when you mentioned that. I've got another one, don't worry. Um, but he said that in order for Noah and his family to be saved, where did they have to be? In the ark. What happens if they left the ark? They would have died. Well, you carry that same idea to the church. Where's the place of spiritual safety? It's in the church. What do we have to do in order to uh, be in that place of safety? We have to enter into the church the way God has prescribed. What happens if we leave that place of spiritual safety? We die in our sins. Uh, I actually have a sermon uh, on that topic, um, and it li literally pointing out, comparing the church to, um, to, to the ark. But the other thing that popped in my head is a lot of times we take the Old Testament and we look at the Old Testament as if, well, we're not under that law anymore, so it's not as important. Brethren, I want to see you explain to me the things that are found in the book of Hebrews without using the Old Testament. You can't use one Old Testament scripture, you can't use one Old Testament description, but explain to me most of the book of Hebrews you have to know Leviticus to know Hebrews. You have to know parts of Genesis to know Hebrews. Because there's talk of the priesthood, the high priest, the temple, Melchizedek, who's in the book of Genesis. You have all of these Old Testament mentions, not to mention the fact that uh, Hebrews chapter 11 jumps all the way through the Old Testament. You have to understand that the two are connected together. I don't know who originally said this, but um, usually it's attributed to Guy in Woods. He made the statement that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. That is, you have so many references to the New Testament in prophecy found in the Old Testament and you have the Old Testament, those prophecies revealed to us, the types, the anti-types and so on within the pages of the New Testament, it, it, they all point back to each other. But not only that, in the New Testament, we're told to love our neighbors as what? Ourselves. Ourselves. How do we do that? Put them first. Put them first. You know where I can read a lot of principles about putting my neighbors first? In the Old Testament. One thing that sticks out in the, in the back of my mind 
is a uh, law that God had given to the Israelites, the law of gleaning. If you remember what the law of gleaning was, when the Israelites took up the harvest, they were to take everything up but what? The, field. the border of the field. That was for gleaning, for those who were poor, for those who were homeless, so to speak. They would be able to go and gather what they needed from their neighbors, even though they may not have been able to afford uh, these items. God was saying, hey, you need to do this in order to take care of who? Your neighbor. We read about principles like that within the pages of our Old Testament Bibles. And I think a lot of times we don't give the Old Testament enough credit as, uh, as we need. You know, uh, you know, Wendell and I were actually talking about the scripture reading he was reading uh, uh, that he read for us today, and we had a little discussion about it. And again, there's a lot of principles that are found in uh, the chapter from First Chronicles that Wendell read to us. You just have to be able to give it the time and look and study. And there's so many things that are found in there for us today. Um, so we need to be sure that we give the appropriate time to the Old Testament. It's also, one of the reasons you may have noticed I've been jumping back and forth between the New Testament and the Old Testament and the Bible classes we've been doing on Sunday mornings. Uh, when we finish up one of the books of the New Testament, we jump back and we do a couple of the books of the, New, uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? Yes, sir. mentioned the fact that John 6.53 would also help give a, a good picture of Christ as the Passover lamb and would help, uh, you know, help you know, us better understand it, would have helped the Jews better understand it, even though this ended up being a hard saying for them. We're actually going to read a few extra verses, but uh, John 6.53 we read, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up from uh, up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And, uh, you know, as Jesus made that statement, there are other times where Jesus made references like this, and the Jews basically assumed he was literally talking about cannibalism. But the idea that he's being provided, if you go back again to the idea, there's a number of thoughts here um, as far as you go back to the Passover lamb, and what did they have to do with the, uh, the flesh? They had to eat of it. In order to be saved, part of that was to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb, wasn't it? They couldn't just spread the blood on the doorpost and then burn the rest of it without consuming it. The only thing that they could burn up and destroy was that which they could not finish. Um, there's also reference to the importance of his blood here. Now, and even some today misconstrue this to the point where they try to say when we take of the Lord's Supper... We're literally eating and drinking the flesh and the blood of Christ. They call it transubstantiation. That's not the case here. But I would dare say that this would be a good study in following in line with the, uh, the, the description of what we're reading here about Christ being the Passover lamb. And I appreciate uh, all the comments so far. Anything else? All right. If not, we've got about five minutes left, but we'll... We're kind of getting into a section here that's similar, but a little bit different. It is connected to what we're reading here. Uh, in verse 9, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. 
So we find out that this technically isn't 1 Corinthians, <laughs> or at least not as we would know it, because he said, I previously wrote you a letter. So technically this would be 2 Corinthians, and the next letter might be 3 Corinthians. But we're told that, well, there's a letter here that I wrote to you, um, and I said not to keep company with fornicators. Well, why don't we have this book? Well, the Lord didn't intend us to have it. Best way I can put it. Um, the contents that are found in it may, may be found very well in First and Second Corinthians to the point where we didn't need it. Um, but the Lord did uh, give us the things that we need to know. He said not to, keep up with, uh, not to keep company with fornicators. Fornicator is one who commits the act of fornication. And as I said, we gave a, a brief description of it last week. It's a general term for an individual who commits any number of sexual sins, uh, up to but not limited to the act of adultery and others. Um, the word keeping company here doesn't mean that you know this person. It, it doesn't mean that you talk to this person from time to time. The word keeping company is a way is as if you're associating with this person in such a way that you're condoning the act that they're committing and you're encouraging that person to continue in said practice. So, I mean, there's a difference here than, like, I meet with someone who I know is a fornicator and we sit down and we talk about it and, you know, uh, he mentions, you know, the fact, you know, certain things he's done. Well, you know, that, that's not what God wants of you. God doesn't want you to do that. That's not the idea of keeping company. That'd be the idea of, well, it's all right for you to do that. God doesn't care. That would be kind of along the lines of it. Or celebrating. Is, uh, is he writing this? He's not just talking about the problem of a man that's mm -hmm. poor. He's not just talking about that. This is in general. He's talking about the church's problem. Mm -hmm. He's talking about attitude problems. Yes. You know, you need to get your attitude straightened out. Mm -hmm. and, and start with this man. Yeah. And that's true, uh, is the fact that their attitude is completely and utterly not what it should be. And so it does start with this one individual and in getting all of that right and uh, getting it where they are living the lives that they should be. Um, and we know and understand uh, from the book of Romans that this is not the life that God would have us to live. Someone read Romans 1, verse 32. Romans 1, verse 32. Who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So God said here, or through the Apostle Paul, that if you were to encourage individuals to continue living in sin, it's just as if you've done that very action. And so by encouraging this person, it was as if they were doing the exact same thing. But as we're going to see, and we're going to have to stop here this morning, but as we're going to see as we continue to read through this chapter, he's not just talking about fornicators in general. He's not just talking about necessarily this man, but he is going to cover other types of um, uh, sins that are found in this world. But we'll get into that when we uh, have class next week. As always, I appreciate everyone's kind attention, uh, those who commented, those who read. Even just the attention that you gave, whether you were here in the building or watching online, I greatly appreciate it. And we'll begin service in about 15 minutes.